Due to the global outbreak of the coronavirus, the Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees, so our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future as we reduce our staffing at VOA headquarters here in Washington. We appreciate your staying with us on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa coming to you from my home here in Arlington, Virginia, a suburb of Washington, D.C. I am Shaka Sali, and today we will discuss racism, tribalism, and inequality on the African continent and the United States. My guests are Johanna LeBlanc, National Security and Foreign Affairs Legal Strategist, and Ni Akwete, Professor of International Affairs at George Washington University here in Washington, D.C. I have to say, Johanna and me, that I am profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you on this special edition of Straight Talk Africa via Skype. Thank you, Shaka. Thank, thank you, Shaka. It's an honor to be on and with my, with my sister. Terrific. First of all, uh, without belaboring the point, you obviously have been following the developments in the United States. You've been following the uprisings, uh, others might say protests. And I think a great man, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who is regarded by some as the conscious of America, once observed that riots or protests are a language of the unheard. Do you agree with him, Johanna? I, I agree with what Martin Luther King, King said, uh, but it has to be done with caution because this is modern day America. Um, the notion of, of looting and, and rioting and, uh, and burning down institutions and, and, and burning um, type, um, properties and so on, I, I, I don't think that is how you actually affect change. There are much more productive ways to do that. I see. What about you, Ni Akwete? I actually um, agree 110% with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. because I think the way he frames he framed it is that rioting happens when people are unheard. If you hear them, we won't even get to the riot. And if you look at George Floyd, the riot did not start the day he was killed. Several days happened. The police were not arrested. They were not charged. So it was um, people pouring into the streets. And also, the riots, there have been credible reports that agents provocateur, sometimes from the right, are actually instigating that. So the riots themselves, yes, are not what we would wish for, but they are a symptom not only of the racism that killed him, by uh, George Floyd, but of the non-response of the authorities. He's not the first black man to be abused and killed. The authorities don't respond. Very interesting. Uh, Johanna, it seems to me that uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., when he made that statement, he was probably aware of the book, The Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. How do you respond to that? Yeah, I understand, and, and as my co-panelists um, greatly articulated, um, the protesting that we see around um, the, the, the death of George Floyd is not just about that. It's about social, economic, and political inequality in America. Um, go back to 1619, when the first 20 enslaved Africans came to the Virginia shores, and we saw that America, one, weaponized the color of the black man, and two, the United States utilized, but, but for the exploitation, the murder, the raping, and the kidnapping of our people, America would not be the great empire that it is today. So people of color have contributed significantly to the development of this country, and they ultimately want their share, their piece of the pie. And, and one thing I want, I want you to be aware of, which 
I'm, I'm sure you are aware of, most of the rioting that is taking place is done by other actors, people who have other motives. Um, and I do believe that there might be some foreign influence. And I think, um, actually, not that I think, a few days ago, Senator Marco Rubio, who is the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, tweeted that um, Iran, China, and unfortunately, another one of our countries in Africa, Zimbabwe, are involved in, in, in the protest and, 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 and provoking um, folks to take the streets. And to a certain extent, it is very alarming to the American government. So. This is a very legitimate protest for very legitimate concerns which have been infiltrated by people with other motives. How do you respond to that, Ni Akwete? Unquestionably, there have been um, um, people infiltrators, agents provocateurs, no question about that. Now, the particular foreign influence I don't know which countries. I think we have to be cautious to make sure we are identifying the, the right countries, especially if we bring in Zimbabwe, because the United States has had, um, you know, a long, uh, fractious relationship with Zimbabwe, 10 years, uh, if, beginning in 1990, between 1980 and 1990, when Zimbabwe became independent, the first 10 years of independence, Robert Mugabe was their darling because he was doing everything they wanted. Once he took back a few of the land that were stolen by whites, and they stole it in the 20th century. Robert Mugabe used to live in Ghana, went to Mugabe, uh, Zimbabwe, saw what was happening, started fighting. Eventually, in 1990 and thereafter, he was pressed to take back the land that whites have stolen. This is when the United States and Britain and Australia turned on him and made him the devil, and that relationship is still fractious. So all I'm saying is, yes, it is true, and yes, there may be foreign countries uh, interfering. Russia, Iran, China, uh, sounds to me credible. Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe is, uh, is not that powerful a country compared to America, so I am, I am cautious. I would like to see the evidence that Zimbabwe is actually interfering and I'm saying people should know the context of the U.S. relationship with Zimbabwe. They have, they have put huge pressure on Zimbabwe since the 1990s, precisely because Robert Mugabe was saying, we have to undo some of the wrongs that white settlers, white racists, white supremacists did in Zimbabwe. Robert Mugabe was reacting to injustice against Africans, how Africans grab land, I mean, our uh, Europeans grab land and abused Africans. And Robert Mugabe was saying, we are going to reverse some of that. He was pushed to do it. And the United States and Great Britain and others said, no, we don't like it that you are taking back stolen property. Robert Mugabe was taking back stolen property. And the U.S. has been very tough on him. So I'm saying, I guess, skeptical when I hear accusations about Zimbabwe, I would like to see the evidence. It is very interesting that uh, you use the key word uh, stolen and uh, probably advisory so, but uh, what is not in doubt is that uh, the Republic of Zimbabwe today was known as Rhodesia. And Rhodesia, the last time I checked uh, some historical records was obviously a personal property at one time yes. of a Scottish British, Sir John Cecil Rhodes. Isn't that correct? Absolutely correct. And not only Zimbabwe was the lesser of his crimes, his biggest crime he committed in what we, uh, South Africa because he actually governed South Africa as Prime Minister of South Africa. He also boosted that he was doing the dirty work of the British Empire. I know my sister called the, um, the U.S. today an empire. I have questions about that because the U.S. elected Obama. The U.S. is also a democracy. I, I teach and I say it's, you know, um, demo it's hard to be a democracy and an empire at the same time. By the way, I was born in Ghana before 1957, so I was born into a real empire. I know what real empires are. But anyway... So, like me, so basically, like me, you are BBC, 
born <laughs> before computers. Isn't that correct? That is infinitely correct. Let me ask you uh, this question. When you look at these protests in the United States, what specifically, in your view, triggered them and why? Obviously, the death of an unarmed black man, um, it's not the first time that it has happened. And it has been extremely difficult to get a conviction on when it comes to these police officers, you know, murdering black people in America. And, and one of the reasons why it's difficult is because of the way our laws are set up. For example, you have to, to, to determine whether or not, the jury has to determine whether or not, this, this, there was reasonable fear. And because of this, I committed the act as a police officer. Uh, so, again, this is so much more than just Floyd. It's about Tamar Rice. It's about Trayvon Martin. It's about countless other Black people in America that have been killed by police officers, and we have seen no justice. And social inequality. For example, uh, um, Shaka, one of the quickest ways to gain wealth in America is through the purchase of, of a home. Um, this year, the Senate Joint Economic Committee released a report on the state of Black America, and it shows that 44% of Black people in America own their homes in comparison to 77 white Americans. And it also shows that Black Americans own, have a total of $17,000 of wealth in comparison to 171,000 of wealth for white Americans. And the, the research goes on and on. It even looks at the education. How much more money do you make when you're well-educated as a black person? And it shows the disparities are there and implicit bias plays a major role. So again, this is about dismantling a system that has historically created to not benefit a certain sector of the American population. People of color want their piece of the American, of, of the pie. And, and I believe that America can do it. And I believe that America should live up to its ideals that all men are created equally. Yes, all men are created equal, but yet in that important document, when, oh, at the time it was put together, black people were not included in all men are created equal because yes. they were in fact included as property. Isn't that Absolutely. correct? Absolutely correct. And, and that is part of the problem. And this is why putting this conversation into context, especially for people who may not understand race relations in America, it is very important to go back to the foundation of what you just said. The Constitution of America did not consider black people to be human beings. And, 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 and the exploitation, the murder, the kidnapping, which have led to the building of this country on the back of black people. And, and we have to talk about those in order to give context to this conversation, which is why I went back to 1619. But what about uh, when you go to 1965? You have uh, this joint House of Congress being addressed by uh, President LBJ, the Indian Bank's Johnson. And in that key address, he borrows some line from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that, quote, we shall overcome. Wasn't that a statement that undermined the area position of the black American as property was in that the time that the black American was in fact incorporated into the United States Constitution as a human being, as a citizen, and therefore he would be part of the language, the important language that says all men are born equal. How about that? I agree. 1965 is very important, and uh, what President Johnson said is important. It, it, in fact, it changed the atmosphere when he used the words of Dr. King. But, uh, you know, black people um, were, the slavery was ended 
in the 1860s, in the waning days of the Civil War, but under President uh, Lincoln, all right? Uh, only black men got the vote at that time, because at that time, only white men, property white men also had the vote. So actually, America, black people, the United States, I think what people should understand is what we are witnessing is actually the 400-year heroism of black people in America, of Africans in America. They were fighting for freedom. And if you equate freedom with democracy, black people were fighting. I am so happy that my sister mentioned 1619, 400 years of heroism, of fighting for freedom, of saying democracy is not just white men, okay? It is for everybody. They have been the conscience of America, but more importantly, they also built this country with their muscle, with the sweat of their brows, while they were being abused. So they have built the country, they have been the, um, the conscience of the country, and this struggle continues to this day. My sister mentioned a lot of the individuals who have been killed unjustifiably by police and by other white people, black people who have been killed unjustifiably. She went back quite a few years, but you could also go to a Thiel, whose murder, a teenager whose murder uh, sparked the uh, uh, U.S. civil rights movement. And as you said, Dr. King is a giant. He has been a conscious. He was standing on the shoulders of people like, um, like Frederick Douglass. He was standing on the shoulders of people. One of my favorites is uh, a woman journalist who is, was just amazing. There were other amazing women freedom fighters. So this is a long journey. The baton now has been handed over to today's generation of black people, and hopefully we'll see a few non-blacks also, because what black people are fighting, they are not saying give freedom to only blacks. They are saying treat everybody equally. Treat everybody equally. Democracy is freedom, and it's freedom for everyone. Everyone needs to enjoy that. What about uh, the queen of the underground railway? Was it yes. someone? Yes. You, you know, as you said, I'm BBC, so my recollection doesn't come quickly. Absolutely, Harriet Tubman, who is now, you know, her image on the 20 American $20 bill has been delayed. President Obama authorized it, but it's been slowed down. We can't wait. Because, you know, you watch American uh, uh, popular music and they talk about the Benjamins because uh, Mr. Benjamin is on the, Benjamin Franklin is on the $20 bill now. We want to see Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill. So we will call the $20 bill the Tubmans. There is a long history. Let me say again, I mean, uh, uh, most of them actually are not known to history, but uh, black people in the United States, to my mind, I cannot think of a group of people anywhere who have been more heroic. They come to a strange continent. And as an African who, who came here, I know how it felt to be uh, in this strange country. And I keep thinking, think about those who came more than 300 years earlier, how they felt. And I got here as a free man. They were not. They were in chains. They, they were branded like cattle, okay? The people use hot iron to brand S on their skin. I think what Africans and black people have done in the United States is so amazing. I once told someone what black people need more than anything else are amazing storytellers. Because the story of black people in the Western Hemisphere, you can look at Haiti, you can look at Brazil, you can look at Jamaica, but even if you focus just on the United States, I don't know of any group of people anywhere who has had such an amazing journey against great odds, and they are still going. To tell you the truth, they humble me, they, make, they inspire me, they humble me, they make me so proud that I share some roots with them. And he tells me what they have did means we can do a lot. So of course, African uh, in this country now, we have enormous solidarity with what is going on. As a matter of fact, since George Floyd, a few other people have been killed. One of them is a Gambian, somebody born in Gambia. So 
I have told the African community here, we are joined at the hips with African Americans. Moreover, I have two adult children. Their mother is African American. So they have, th this is our fight. And I'm, just to say, African Americans are so heroic, I don't even know how to find the words to say it. Johanna, what about uh, the contributions that are uh, rarely referred to by a great French philosopher by the name Descartes, who came up with this idea, this construct that caught, I think, therefore, I am, unquote. You know, um, you are what you think you are, right? Um, and, and I think that people of color in America um, were some of the most amazing people. Because in spite of the the challenges, the systemic oppression in America, we have been able to reach some level of social mobility in America. Um, we have been able to gain uh, political clout. We have been able to accomplish enormous successes. But it is not to say that the challenges are still not there. And, and we're not talking about this white man who is racist or this white woman who is racist we are talking about a system that was designed for the oppression and suppression of a certain sector of the population. And as my co-panelist, the professor, um, said earlier, this is about justice for everyone. This plight is also for justice when it comes to poor white people in America. Because the reality is that poor white people in this country have been told that be because you are white, you are better off. When the reality is that in the year 2019, if a child is born in poverty, that child is more likely than ever before in the history of this country to die in poverty. That is unacceptable. For America to have been able to exert global dominance for so long all over the world, and for us to, for this country to be where it is today, it's unacceptable. We can do better and we must do better. And, and I can tell you, you know, I, I'm an immigrant in this country from the Republic of, of Haiti. I came here at the age of nine. And I've been able to um, accomplish some, some things, a few things. And what I can tell you is that, you know, I've been able to go to law school and, and do so many amazing things. What I can say is that, but for America, I wouldn't be having this conversation with you, Shaka, with my co-panelists. Because in my country, when you are born of a certain social class, if it's low, if it's middle, whatever the case may be, you remain in that class for the most part until your death. So in America, there is a sliver of hope. And I know what America is capable of. We have the resources, we have the brains, we have the willpower. But it's, it's about institutions, the private sector, the government to come together to be willing to intentionally redesign the system because racism was intentional. You cannot address racism without being intentional about reversing what has been done. So some people have a problem with the notion of uh, reparations because they think it's unfair. They think that because my family, because I was not directly of a, a, a slave master, so I can't be held accountable. But the reality is that, as a white person in this country, when your great great grandparents and your grandparents were building wealth, guess what was happening to black people in this country? They were denied access to education, to employment, to wealth. And we can even go back after the war when the black when folks came back, they had the GI Bill to purchase property. Black soldiers were left out. You have True. redlining. When your property was building wealth, guess what? The property of my ancestors were going down. For those of us who even had access to, to property, right? So we have to be intentional about restructuring the system in order to properly address racial, social, and economic injustice in this country. Johanna, you mentioned that uh, you are an immigrant from... Uh the Great Republic of Haiti, a republic, if I recall correctly, 
that liberated itself from French colonialism and became independent around 1804. Is that correct? Absolutely, Shanka. Uh, you know, as a Haitian American woman, I am so proud of um, Toussaint Louverture, Jean Jacques de Saline, and, and, and um, Catherine Fouan, and, and, and countless other um, heroes and sheroes of the Haitian Revolution. So uh, let me give you guys a, a, a bit, some nas, some nas, uh, a bit summary of the revolution. The revolution was not just about Haitians gaining their freedom from France. It was about freeing black people from all over the world. So in 1804, when, the, when, the, when Haiti gained its independence, a year afterwards, the Haiti government amended its constitution to make it such that, one, anybody who is black were to step foot on Haiti soil would be considered free. A white man could not own land nor be a slave master. So think about this in the context of what was happening in America, in Africa around this time. So in a way, actually in a way, in every way, the Haitian Revolution undermined white supremacy. As we know, white supremacy has been about economic gain, utilizing black bodies for exploitation to gain more wealth. That's what it's all about. So Haiti was ostracized by the entire world for 60 years. The American government did not recognize Haiti as an independent state, which meant that Haiti could not trade with other nations. But in spite of, Haiti was doing very well for itself, was the most prosperous nation in that hemisphere outside of the Americas for a very long time. It has led to the independence of so many other nations within the Korea, within Latin America. So we've but, done it in 1804, we can do it again in 2020. But what about some who say, wait a minute, you still have problems of social, economic, political injustice in Haiti? Absolutely, there, there are, you know, no doubt there are challenges just like anywhere in the world, but I think that, you know, governments in Haiti are doing the best that they could in order to address those, those situations. And what you have to understand is that just like many African countries, we have to understand the environment in which these governments are operating under when it comes to Western influence without understanding that nothing makes sense, which is why when people say, well, did the Republic of IET gain its independence in 1804? Why do we have these challenges? But if you don't understand what the 1804 revolution meant to the rest of the world, nothing will make sense. And that's why when I'm having a conversation about race relations anywhere in the world, you have to go back to the history. Ni akuete. Indugu, thank you so much. I, I am actually stunned because, of course, this is the first time I'm meeting my sister. And in fact, when she mentioned she was an immigrant from uh, the Great Republic of Haiti, I didn't even hear the Haiti well. And I am stunned because in my work here, I've done just a little bit of focus on uh, Haiti. So I don't know as much as she does, but the little I know inspires me. I will tell you that I got some very important Americans to focus on Haiti. Uh, my former boss became close friends with President Aristide. I met President Aristide in Washington. And so Haiti inspires me, uh, not just me. You know, the African Union looks at Africa as a continent of five regions. And they have also said, we want to bring in the entire diaspora as the sixth region. Of when the you talk... When you talk about uh, your former boss, uh, Ni, are we talking here about uh, Ewan Randall Robinson, who used to head the popular Trans-Africa I am talking, Washington? I am talking about that very man. I worked for him for 11 years. As a matter of fact, I spoke to him last week. And yes, I mean, he played such a big role in the uh, changing America's terrible policy supporting apartheid. We changed, he changed, he led the U.S. Uh, anti-apartheid movement to change the policy under President Reagan, but Reagan was continuing what other presidents had done. So yes, I'm talking about Randall, but he has strong connections with Haiti too. 
as I'm saying, he's written books. In fact, the little that I know of Haiti comes because of his interest in Haiti. And I'm saying the African Union wants to bring in the rest of the world, I mean, the African diaspora, as the sixth region. But that is the rest of the world uh, where there are black people. And if you look closely, they have favored Haiti, okay? They came close to making Haiti a full member. So I am saying, I am just learning from my sister that she has Haitian roots. That inspires me even more. And the African Union came this close. Haiti is such an inspiration. And quickly, as she mentioned, yes, Haiti is still struggling. But you have to understand why. The United States said they were for democracy in 1776. But when Haitians defeated the French, the greatest superpower of the time, the U.S. joined France in saying Haiti must pay reparations to France. But I'm telling you, Haiti is another inspiration of amazing Africans who went, who were taken forcibly to the Western Hemisphere, and from the day they landed, they were fighting for freedom. Bob Marley put it very well and said, fighting on arrival, fighting for survival, buffalo soldiers. Africans in the Western Hemisphere have been amazing buffalo uh, soldiers. As I often say, there is no democracy in the studio. When your producer says you go for a break, you have to go. When we come back, we shall continue with the discussion. So please, don't go away. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. Every week, connect with our experts. You can ask them your questions and get their advice. Join me, Lina Hormudu, in Washington on Healthy Living, your new health program right here on Voice of America. Welcome back to Straight Talk Africa. And we are talking about racism, tribalism, and inequality on the African continent and here in the United States. And my guests are Johanna LeBlanc, National Security and Foreign Affairs Legal Strategist, and Ni Akwete, Professor of International Affairs at George Washington University here in Washington, D.C. Back in 2009, I had a privilege of paying a courtesy call on South Africa's second president, Tabombeki, exactly. at his home in Johannesburg. He told me, of course, that he had a very soft spot for the Republic of Haiti. And that was, by the way, the time when Aristide, President Aristide himself, was in fact residing in South Africa under some kind of exile. It was no coincidence that he chose to go to South Africa. You are completely right. President Tabo Mbeki is a huge fan of, of Haiti because President Tabo Mbeki really understands African history and global black history. I know in Dugu that you know of a certain other African called uh, Kwame Nkrumah, Osajifo Kwame Nkrumah. President uh, Tabo Mbeki has actually pressured other leaders in Africa, including in Ghana, and say, hey, you need to read more about who Nkrumah was and who, what he did. So President Tabo Mbeki is, is, has been on a mission before he was president, when he was president, and since, to of saying to people, you need to understand our history, you need to appreciate our heroes. And the reason President uh, Aristide, when he was overthrown the second time and forced out of power, with dubious support of elements in the United States, Randall Robinson was on the plane with him, and he helped, and they wanted to put him in quarantine in some Central African country, and he pushed, and President uh, Aristide went to South Africa because President Tabo Mbeki also appreciates Haiti so much and appreciates uh, um, President uh, Aristide. So just bottom line is, my sister, I was so glad we were on the program together, and that was before I knew that you had, you had um, uh, Haitian roots. So Haiti is an inspiration. African-Americans are an inspiration. I hope my relatives and brothers and sisters on the continent will understand that outside of the continent, 
black people who were forced to go, they actually inspire us. Just one quick second. President, in Krum, uh, uh, President Julius Nyerere has said, he said, the reason President Nkrumah was so effective in pushing for African independence, Ghana's independence, and then the rest of Africa, was because he learned from African Americans in the United States where he was educated. Pan-Africanism, W.U.B. Du Bois, who was buried in Ghana. So the connections are all there, and Africans in the United States, in Haiti, and in the rest of the Western Hemisphere have been doing an unbelievable job. We, today's generation, need to know the history, be inspired. What we might want to do may seem like it's difficult. It's nothing compared to what enslaved black people did. Just think of Haiti, enslaved people beating France. When you mention uh, President Nyerere, of course, you are talking about uh, Mwarimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere, the founding president of Tanzania. Pre well, pre I have to add also that uh, in the same year of 2009, the year, that, uh, the year in which I paid a courtesy call on former South African President Mbeki, I also had the privilege of driving from the Ghanaian capital Accra with Nkrumah's only daughter, Samia, who at the time was a member of parliament from yes. Afasin. Yes. We drove to Krofu, yes. the birthplace of yes. her father, yes. Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Yes. It was I, incredible. Yes. And, and you know, President uh, um, uh, Mwalimu Julius Nyerere said something that inspires me. I mean, I have so many sources of inspiration. He said, uh, and I think all black people need to embrace this. He said, we as black people, where other people have walked, we must run. And so for me, we have to be inspired. As for uh, Samia Nkrumah, I have a huge respect for her. I hope she makes a comeback in Ghanaian uh, um, politics. I have to tell you, I was in her Flagstaff house in the early 1960s, when she was like three years old, I was a, a, a primary school student. They took us there, and her father came out with her, holding her on his shoulder and his brother. And so, anyway, their their family is so inspirational which, which, to me. Which, which brother? Are you talking about uh, Gamar Ogoke Nkrumah or Seku Nkrumah? I'm talking about the younger brother, Seku Nkrumah. Um, the father came out with them because they threw a big party for school children. It must have been in September on Founders Day. And the point is that that family is so inspirational, and I think Samia Nkrumah is hugely talented. I, I am sorry that trying to resuscitate the party of Kwame Nkrumah, the CPP in Ghana, has proved difficult because I think the country needs that. We need a very progressive political party in Ghana, but I don't want to focus on Ghana too much. Although my sister also told me she lived in Accra, and I was so proud because that's my birthplace. Johanna, let's go back to the reason we are here, and we're talking about uh, the protests in anger, in support of the manner in which George Floyd lost his work lost his life in Minneapolis, Minnesota, under uh, police brutality. It was said that George, like a lot of others before him, was a victim of racism. What is racism? Racism is utilizing um, your privilege for the oppression and suppression of a certain group of, of people, right? Um, but I want to point on something, um, Shaka, which I think is very important. But I think I, you better first and foremost really explain racism thoroughly. That is yes. the question at hand right now. So racism in America is the systematic uh, oppression and suppression of people of, of color in America. Uh, because the reality is that when you have a system that was built to 
disproportionately to intentionally discriminate against a certain group of people, it does not do well for the development of this country. And we are talking about racism is redlining, right? Racism is about not having access to quality education. So in, in America, everybody has access to education from K through 12 at the very minimum. But racism has played a key role in the quality of education which black people get. Racism is also when a community has too many black people, the property value goes down. Racism is environmental injustice. Racism is police brutality. Racism impacts just about every aspect of our lives. But when we go back to what transpired with the police officer, I what always a, think this. What about the quality of health care? Absolutely. Not having access to health care is a form of racism. Uh, but I also think that when you have people who are in leadership, who lack empathy and compassion, it is fundamentally lethal to society. So outside of the law, when that officer had his knee on George Floyd's neck, George Floyd said, I cannot breathe. I cannot breathe. Where is your compassion? Where is your empathy? How do you put your knee on someone's neck and continue to do so after they say they cannot breathe and you hurt them loud and clear? And that is something that, yes, laws are good. Laws are a piece of tool that we can use to get redressed in court. But the hearts of men cannot be legislated. The hearts of men in this country and all over the world must be changed. Are you talking about uh, attitudes and mindsets? Yes, absolutely. Implicit biases. I'm talking about having compassion, having empathy. And I think those words are often not used when you talk about leadership. And I used to think that laws are sufficient to change the landscape of society. Because the reality is you have the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And you have countless other laws to address racism in America. You have institutions like the EEOC to report employment discrimination. You have the EPA, which is a whole other conversation because the EPA addresses environmental racism depending on who the president is, right? But the point I'm trying to make is that laws are not sufficient to address racism and implicit biases in America. The hearts of men must also change. What about you, Ni Akwete? What is racism? Thank you. I, of course, agree with my sister about the various forms that racism takes in this country, in the United States, because I'm also, like you, in Dugu, I'm, I'm based in uh, Arlington, a suburb of, uh, of Washington, D.C. So everything she says about how racism is manifested in the United States is completely true. The only thing I'll add about it is because since this show is focused in Africa, um, the audience is being to Africa, we must not, we must understand that there is racism around the world, okay? There's racism in Africa. I is, mentioned is, is, is what is in Africa racism or is it what they call tribalism or ethnocentrism? We have both. We have both. There's racism in Africa, in Zimbabwe, in South Africa, in Namibia, even in Kenya. Today in Kenya, there are white people in Kenya who still abuse black Kenyans. I heard it and I was shocked. So quickly, and, what, and what is the justification for racism, just like tribalism, really? Yes, well, because it is prejudice, it, racism. If you want to, you know, there's prejudice that is then put into action. If the prejudice is based on race, okay, white and non-white, even, look, Ch the Chinese uh, 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 last month, two months ago, they were practicing racism against blacks in China, and the Chinese are not white. So racism is prejudice and, and uh, put into action against people of another race. In Africa, 
I, I even call it because it is it is pushed by whites globally. Mostly it is pushed by whites against non-whites. I call it white supremacy. I think they believe whites are supreme in every way. And so I think we should call it white supremacy. But I'm saying outside of the world, uh, outside of America, it operates too. But you raise uh, an important point, which I think we must address importantly. I think we Africans have to understand that prejudice against others is unacceptable. Tribalism, ethnic uh, uh, tensions, Right now, it's boiling in Ethiopia because they are about to have elections. People are being displaced because they say, you are not from this area, you are not from that area. I am not actually, um, you know, singling out Ethiopia because the 55 member countries of the Africa Union, only two have one ethnic, I mean, local language. The 53 others are all multi-ethnic, different languages, uh, different uh, uh, cultures, and this is why we need democracy. What America is doing, actually, I think you have to see that there is a lot of good to the way people are reacting. In a democracy, people say, if there is an injustice, we don't like it, we the people. In American great documents, I think the three most important words are we the people. So what you see now is we, the American people, rising up and saying, killing George Floyd like that and all those others and the 400 years of racism is wrong. And I'm saying we in Africa must learn that the people must fight prejudice when it's in the form of a white person thinking that he deserves to take African land that I, I, I was once in Nairobi and some white man just jumped the line. And I was so proud of my wife then, who walked up to him and said, no, you need to go back to the back of the line. Everybody is equal. I was proud of that. We must push against white supremacists in Africa, but we must also look inwards. We must fight against tribalism in Africa because it's so dangerous. In this day and age, if a particular ethnic group is being discriminated against, they are being encouraged to react, and often the reaction will become violent. So yes, I think we must fight against tribalism and, and ethnocentrism, but we must also understand the, the roots, that the, the evil roots that it shares with racial prejudice and white supremacy. Johanna, why is racism or ethnocentrism or tribalism very dangerous? Surely, it's not simply because of prejudice. People do not eat prejudice. What about others who say, what the reason really, the driving force really, is about control of resources and determining opportunities? I, I think there is an element to that uh, because part of racism is the exploitation of human resources for the purpose of um, profit. Right, um, and we see that in America and, and all across of the world. Uh, but I think it's it's so much deeper than that because I I do believe fundamentally, your skin color in the, in the context of America has been weaponized, which is why when a police officer sees you versus a white man, if you're black, he's more likely to pull out a gun versus pulling out a gun from when it comes to a, a white man. That is because. We have been taught, because racism is taught, we have been taught that black people are naturally violent individuals. And also, why is it that when you're walking down the street and you see a black man, you go across the street? Because you think this black man is going to attack you. And that is because you've been taught that this person is violent. And I'll take it a step further. I have spent significant amount of time all across the African continent. And one of the things that I, I'm always um, I wouldn't say I'm shocked about, is the lack of understanding as it relates to systemic racism in America. Oftentimes, when I talk to my fellow Africans on the continent or Africans in the, in the, in the Caribbean, they tell you the reason why Black people are dealing with the traumas that they're dealing with in America is because of, well, some of them, rather, is because of misbehavior. <laughs> not understanding fundamentally the deep-rooted issues. And, 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 and I remember I was in a university, I was at the University of Cape Town, 
um, with, with my black brothers and sisters um, from different parts of, of Africa, and we were discussing race relations, even in South Africa. My black, my black brothers and sisters from other countries outside of South Africa were saying the reason why black South Africans in Africa are not prospering is because they don't want to take advantage of opportunities. And, and, and that is why it is so important to put things into context. Because if you don't put it into context, this conversation means nothing. Because the whole premise behind these conversations is to give the world a better understanding of very complicated and highly nuanced um, situations. Even the courts here in America have had a really hard time dealing with this um, issues of discrimination because it is highly complicated and it's highly nuanced. But one last point I'm going to make is that to be a black person in America and to understand what racism is, what neocolonialism is to be in constant rage. And I think um, Baldwin said that one, one time. And it's true because once you understand it, you can identify it in different spaces. Another example, black women are some of the most educated group of people in America, but yet we're the least underpaid. We're the most underpaid, rather. And that is because, one, due to gender discrimination, obviously, and two, because of racism. The notion is that for, for, for black people, you know, we're not going to hire them for, for different reasons. And, and we have to check our implicit biases. And I have them. We all have them. Let's be honest. And we have to check them. We have to say to ourselves, why do I think this way? And we have to challenge ourselves as a, as, as a global community. Because we can do better. And we must do better. Because in order for our village to continue to thrive, we have to address some of these challenges in America and all across the globe. Nia Afuete, yes. is there any relationship between racism and some definition of politics which goes that politics is about who gets what, when, where, and why, and what about I, ethnocentrism and tribalism? Isn't it really about power? Isn't it really about excluding others from the resources at hand, from the opportunities that makes one tick. Unquestionably, they are connected. In fact, this is a rephrasing of the question that you asked my sister, which I think is a great question, which is, is it about just resources? And she said it's about resources, but it's deeper than that because it also goes to attitude and then there's the ignorance. I agree completely and totally, but I think the two are connected. Yes, fundamentally, it is about resources, okay? Uh, prejudice is, be, is operationalized, and to use a word, weaponized, in order to make sure that a group of people get a whole lot of the resources just for themselves and exclude most of others. Now, when those group, uh, group of people look at themselves as a race, as their skin color, then it is racism, but it can be done on tribal basis, okay? Uh, and second, I want to say it is con it, the, the two are linked. I wouldn't separate it as it is power, power used to control resources, but she's right. It is also about attitudes and um, the lack of understanding in Africa of uh, race relations in America is so true. As a matter of fact, I will tell you I am guilty of it. I have been in the United States more than 40 years and slowly I am learning. A great friend of mine said to me, Ni, why do you Africans even come here free when you know how we were brought here? I'm talking about an African-American and what they do to us. And I said to him, my brother, you know, I confess we don't know. We do not know. We do not understand race relations. But there is a reason why. Those who benefit from race relations, uh, racial oppression in America, as my sister said, you know, the policeman, the attitude, even lower classes of white people, they have been miseducated. In fact, the miseducation that black people are dangerous is used to cover up the crimes that have been committed against black people. I used to say to my aforementioned boss, I said, 
it's crazy to me for white people to say that they are afraid of black people. It's black people should be afraid of them because they have committed so many crimes against black people. I mean, we haven't mentioned the word lynching. Everybody should go into any um, um, dictionary or reference work and look up the word lynching. This is uh, even after the Civil War, when black people supposedly were no longer uh, enslaved, white people thought it was okay just to kill them. But Grab people, them, make people, something up, and kill them. People who have power also control the narrative, don't yes. they? they? They do, and they use it to lie, they use it to, to cover up the truth, which is why programs like this, programs like others, you, people need to educate themselves. In fact, I once said this to this, this same brother that, look, he said, our educational system is terrible, especially in black communities. Unquestionably, it's true. But even if you spend 20 years in school, uh, including graduate school, they are not going to teach you everything. The thing you learn in school is you acquire a thirst for knowledge because the rest of your life must be about learning, 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 and most important is to learn how is it that so many black people are in the Western Hemisphere? How did they get there? I have had people say, well, you know, Africans were complicit in slavery. A sliver of Africans were. But that lets off the hook. The huge involvement of Europe. Europeans built ships and they went to Africa and took slaves. The slavery enriched Europe. Read Walter Rodney, how Africa under uh, how Europe underdeveloped Africa. So we all must educate ourselves and learn. Of course, African Americans have done a good job, like my sister has, of going to the continent and trying to learn. But even on the continent, I'm also saying sometimes we have oppression by one group against another. The same Africans in the same country, and so black people outside also need to understand that. There are these uh, frictions and competitions and injustices even on the continent. And on the continent, those w watching this program must not feel superior to say, hey, you know, America is not a perfect democracy and it's being exposed. In fact, democracy in America is not complete, it's not perfect. I hate to say this, uh, but pardon me again to refer to a great man the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Yes. When he said, for example, quote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, unquote. What did he really have on mind? What was he actually saying? The great Reverend Martin Luther King was referring to is, we're not we must not turn blind eye to injustice, whether it's happening in the United States, on the African continent, in the Caribbean, and in Asia, in Europe, or wherever the case may be, because um, injustice anywhere is a threat to your own justice, wherever you may be. And, and I think that people across the world um, echo that sentiment, because you have seen, when it comes to the issue of, of the killing of George Floyd, there have been protests all over the world, in France, the African continent, in Nigeria, in, uh, in Liberia, in South Africa, in so many other countries, um, to show solidarity with uh, the brothers and sisters who are living in America. So I think that even though you're here in America or in Africa, you have a duty to care about the injustice that is happening all over the world. Time, unfortunately, happens not to be our best ally. And on that note, our distinguished guests are Johanna LeBlanc and Ni Akwete. Thanks to our audience for tuning into Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not better Africa. And please, please remember to keep the African hopes alive.